Well, I'd like to wish you a good morning. It's been good to be out today as we have come together to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. I'd like to thank Jesse for giving me an opportunity to, to lead singing. It's not something I always do, but I do appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I hope that everyone has been encouraged by our, our worship so far. And I appreciate the others who have uh, participated in worship, who have uh, put a lot of thought into what they have done. And uh, I pray that the Lord has been glorified with what we have done this morning. As you go around and uh, go from church to church and live your life, you might hear some phrases every once in a while that just kind of stick with you. There's one phrase in particular that I want to talk about this morning that I've heard, and it's not particularly a phrase that I don't, I don't know where it started. Uh, as far as I know, it's not a, a precisely a biblical phrase, although I think that it is biblically substantiated. It is a biblical idea, but not a phrase that comes from the Bible. And that phrase that I want to talk to you about this morning is the phrase, Remember who you are. When I was worshiping at Kelly Spring Road Church of Christ in uh, Harvest, Alabama, which is just outside of Huntsville, Alabama, the elders would uh, do announcements at the end of services. And usually, uh, a lot of times, oftentimes at the end of their announcements as they were wrapping up, they would tell everyone in the congregation that as they went out into the world, To remember who you are. And that phrase has always kind of stuck with me. And it's something that I I think about from time to time. And it's a phrase that I want to kind of study this morning. Christians, as we go out into the world, we need to have a remembrance of who we are. Remember who we are as Christians And in order to remember who we are, we have to know who we are in the first place. And so this is to stir up by way of reminder, as as Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1. This is to stir up by way of reminder of us, all of us, who we are as Christians. So that as we go into the world, we can remember who we are. As Christians... We are made in the image of God. And this, most of these are going to be true for only Christians, but some of them are also true for everyone. And that would be the case with this one. Every single person is made in the image of God. Over in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27, it said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Every single person is created in God's image. And one thing that we strive to do, one thing that all mankind should strive to do, is to live as those who are made in God's image. We ought not to desecrate the image of God that we are made in. But we all have, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But as as we understand as Christians, we have been reborn. and, And one of the things that we strive to do as Christians is to honor that image of God that we are made in, and we are are striving to to live according to that image. (coughs) Another thing we are is the object of God's love. And again, this is not just Christians. This is everyone. Turn over to John 3. John 3. I hope you have your Bibles open and, and turning. We're going to be turning to a lot of passages today. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. We sang a song a moment ago, He loves me, He gave Himself to die for me because He loves me so. Every single person, the whole world, God loves us. 
And he proved that by sending his only son. In Romans chapter 5, turn over to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Each and every one of us, every human being is the object of God's love. God loves you and you ought to remember that and you ought to remember what he was willing to do because he loves you and you ought to honor that. You're also a Christian. And in that name bears great responsibility. Turn over to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 is the first time we see this term in verse 26. Starting in verse 25, just to give a little bit of context, this is talking about Barnabas. It says, And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That name Christian literally means little Christ. That is, it is someone who is uh, imitating Christ. And we see this term used in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. We'll start in verse 15 for context. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. As Christians, we bear the name of Christ. And as we go out into the world, other people know that we bear the name of Christ. And we ought to not bring that name reproach. Rather, we ought to bring that name glory. We ought to glorify God in this name. Even if we suffer, even if we're persecuted, even if people revile us, we can still bring glory to God in that name by how we act. And so we ought to remember that we bear Christ's name. We also ought to remember that we are children of God. Turn over to 1 John chapter 3. He sang a song a moment ago saying that we are his child. Praise the Lord, I am his child. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. John says that because of the love that God has shown on us. We can be called children of God. Paul elaborates on this concept over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 15. He says, Romans chapter 8 verse 15, For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fe fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. We need to understand that as children of God, we have benefits of being children of God. Paul talks about it here that we are heirs. You think about this concept in the world that if you have parents, most uh, people have a last will and testament and they leave something as an inheritance for their children. Well, God also has an inheritance for his children. He has an inheritance which he gave to Christ, and Christ is reigning, but we also can be fellow heirs with Christ because of this adoption that we have received. We can also be called children of God. 
and obtain the benefits therein. And as children of God, we ought to understand that children act like their parents. They look like their parents. They talk like their parents. They walk like their parents. We ought to be like God in our behavior as well. This one might strike you as a little bit odd. You are a sheep. Turn over to John chapter 10. We'll be studying this chapter tonight as we've been going through the book of John on Sunday evenings. John chapter 10. And verse 11, Jesus says there, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus talks about his, how he's the good shepherd here. But what is implied is that his followers are sheep. And over in Acts chapter 20 in verse 28, Paul also talks about this concept. Jesus is the good shepherd, but... If you have elders over you, they are shepherds over you as well. And Paul talks to the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The idea of being sheep is that we follow our shepherds. As we have elders here at Spruce Pine, we ought to follow our shepherds. And also, we ought to follow, most importantly, the good shepherd, Jesus, who laid down his life for the sheep. And the other thing about being a sheep is that the sheep know their shepherd. They know his voice and they follow him. We ought to follow Jesus' voice and know his voice and know whether the things that we're being told are from Jesus or are from someone else. That is part of being a sheep. We are also soldiers in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We sang just a moment ago, soldiers of Christ arise. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. We understand that we're fighting a war. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 6, that we are standing up against the schemes of the devil and he is firing fiery darts at us and, and waging war against us. We are soldiers in that war. And as Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, we can put on the whole armor of God and we can stand against the devil and his, his demons and his schemes. We can fight a proper war. But we ought to understand as soldiers that we ought to be focused on the war. We ought to be focused on what our great commander, Jesus Christ, is telling us what we ought to do. As Paul talks about here, being a good soldier of Jesus Christ means you don't entangle yourself in the affairs of everyday life. Rather, you're focused on winning the war. We ought to not become bogged down with the things that are of this world and of this life because we have something more important to do. You are also a slave of righteousness. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Paul says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. 
Perhaps we don't like to think of ourselves as slaves, but the Bible presents a picture that, yes, we are slaves. We are slaves of righteousness if we are Christians, if we are truly doing what the Lord has commanded us, and we ought to remember that. You think about what a slave does. A slave is worried about what his master tells him and not much else. Now, we understand that as slaves of righteousness, we have liberty, we have freedom in that. But we ought not to forget to whom we serve. Whom is, who is our master? It is Jesus Christ. And it is righteousness. We also ought to remember that we are strangers. We are pilgrims. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you turn over there with me, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. Hebrews 11 verse 13 talks about the heroes of faith, so to speak, that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Peter talks about this concept over in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter says you are aliens, you are strangers. And what he means by that is we are not of this world. We are, are not supposed to, to be like the people of the world. Rather, we are strangers. We are pilgrims, as we sang about a moment ago. We don't live here, so to speak. This is not our home. And so we ought not to get too comfortable. We ought not to become like the people around us. Instead, we ought to be putting on the deeds of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ought to keep our behavior, behavior excellent while we are here in our pilgrimage. We are also members of the body of Christ. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23, we understand that Christ is the head and the church is his body. And Paul talks about this concept that the body is not just one member. It is many. We are members of his body. And Paul talks about this concept in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. For just as we have them many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And what this means is that we ought to be functioning as a member of the body of Christ. Each and every one of us have different functions nuanced functions, but we're all working in the same body. And so we're all working toward the same goal for the health and the building up of the body. But we realize that we have different roles. And so we ought to be functioning as whatever member of the body of Christ that we are. 
We also ought to remember that we are citizens of God's kingdom. And this plays to the point that I made just a moment ago. We're strangers here on earth. That's because we're citizens of the kingdom of God. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we are sojourning here on earth, we ought to remember that our home is in heaven and that we're eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to come and take us home. That's what we're waiting for. Our citizenship is there. And so we ought to act as citizens, citizens of heaven. I should say on the PowerPoint Colossians 1, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. And in verse 13, it says, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we were once in the domain of darkness, but through Christ, through obeying the gospel, we have been transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. And that next verse leads me to my last point this morning. It says, in whom we have Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We are redeemed. The idea of being redeemed is being bought back. It is something uh, that we see quite a bit in the Old Testament, the laws of redemption that uh, land could be sold for a period of time, uh, sold from one member of Israel to another, but during certain times it was to be redeemed, that is given back, bought back and given to its rightful owner. Well, this concept of redemption is the idea that we belong to God, but we sold ourselves to Satan. We sold ourselves to iniquity. But through the blood of Christ, we've been bought back. We've been redeemed. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So we had sold ourselves to lawless deeds, to iniquity. Jesus died so that he could redeem us, buy us back to good deeds. So that we could be zealous for these good deeds and we could be purified through him. That's why we were redeemed. So that we could live for Jesus. So that we would be possessed by Him as it was from the beginning. I want you to look at this list. It's not exhaustive. There are very many other things that we could add to this list this morning. And while it's not exhaustive, I feel like this is a good summation of what Christians are. We were made in the image of God, and God loved us. Of course, we sinned and fall, fell short of God's glory, but God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He loved us so much that even while we were enemies, He died for us. And now, being having obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we bear His name. We're Christians. We are children of God. We are His sheep. We are soldiers in the war. We are slaves of righteousness. We are strangers on this earth. 
We are members of the body of Christ. We are citizens in God's kingdom. We have been redeemed. One reason why I preach this sermon is because discouragement and apathy come from a lack of mind, mindfulness. If we find ourselves discouraged, if we find ourselves apathetic toward our lives as Christians, then we need to remember who we are. If we remember who we are, then we can take strength in that to do what is right. And so I hope that this has been an encouragement to do so this morning. It may be that you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you haven't, you have an opportunity this morning. If you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and maybe you haven't been mindful of who you really are, then you'll have an opportunity in just a moment to, to come forward and make that right. And I would encourage you, as we're about to sing this invitation song, number 411, Redeemed. Think about the words that we're about to sing. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, His child and forever I am. Can you sing that honestly? <coughs> or are those just words coming out of your mouth? If you have any need, won't you come while we stand and we sing?